Steve. I hope you're all well today. Um, I wanted to talk about SIMCA, the Social Identity Model of Collective Action, Van Zommeren. Uh, the year escapes me. I am going to um, refer to some notes during this um, video because I want I can't remember everything. I can remember some facts, but I can't remember everything. Now, the social identity model of collective action, I found it very interesting when I did my last module. Really, it tied together through a media analysis um, much research uh, regarding why people become activists and what motivates individuals to protest. Um, and they really tied together three elements to form this social identity model of collective action which were the relative deprivation theory, the resource mobilization theory, and social identity theory. So again, this is a very important model within social psychology, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about it today. Uh, obviously, to share my knowledge of it with you, if you're not aware of it, but also as a little refresher for myself, which is in many ways why I do these videos. It's a very good way to revise. It's a very good way to kind of um, go back to models or theories that you may have done on a previous module and then perhaps moved away from or forgotten about. So the social identity uh, model of collection of collective action, I thought I'd tie it in with Remainers and the protests we've seen over the last two years after Brexit. Obviously I could do the same about Leavers but I think we've seen probably more protest and social media campaigns by the Remain camp than we have by the Leave camp. I suppose because the Leave camp one, so they don't have to go out and shout about it, although they are getting a bit more vociferous now that the deal is in question. Um, so since the Brexit result, there have been obviously a lot of protests from people who aren't happy that we're leaving the European Union, the UK is leaving the European Union. And also, I think there's been a lot of negative media and social discourse about Remainers, mainly, you know, Ramoners is a big one, people call Ramoners. Uh, which has probably left some Remainers very, very angry and be feeling like they're not legitimate citizens of the state. I mean, Theresa May has, I would say, probably not taken the 49% or whatever it was of the population into account in the last two years. She seems to just uh, not want to uh, please Remainers at all, from what I can see, which is... which. I don't know. It, it just seems like an insane move. But let's not get into that because that's politics and this is all about psychology. So um, anyway, so obviously the, a lot of the Remainers reacted, reacted angrily to the result of the Brexit referendum. And they have been vociferous ever since and they've been protesting like Britain first. Uh, are they Britain first? Not Britain first. Uh, oh God, I can't remember the name of the group. Best for Britain. That's it. Best for Britain. And there's my phone going off. I'll have to put that in silent. We don't want that beeping all the way through this. Mm. So anger can sort of lead to action if identity is strong within a group. And I think the identity of Remainers is a very good example. Um, I think the identity of Remainers is very strong. It's a very strong identity. It's pro-EU, but it's not only pro-EU. It's probably pro many other values that Remainers see themselves as having, which is openness to experience, openness to globalization, to trade, openness to, to being part of uh, a world union, and possibly also, and I'm not saying, because I know a lot of Leavers, and the whole perception of them being racist is just wrong. I, I don't agree with that at all. I, I, I have to admit, when the Brexit result came along, I was very angry and I probably did have a lot of those preconceptions, but I think that's probably wrong in most cases. And I've listened to a lot of people speak about the European Union and why they voted leave. And, and you know, I've, I've very much appreciated their point of view. So let's not go down that road. This is not me being a Remainer or a Ramoner. Now, I want to talk about the social identity model of collective action. Now, collective action or activism is when people act to improve the conditions of a group for which they identify. Um, now, according to Van Zommeren, 2017, there are three core social psychological theories as to why people protest. The first is relative deprivation theory, and that was devised by Stouffer, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Stouffer, S-T-O-U-F-F-E-R, et al, in 1949. Now, relative deprivation theory posits that 
people will feel a sense of deprivation relative to, relative to similar others. For example, let's say you were in an organization and you felt that the guy or the girl doing the same job as you was getting paid more. You would be more annoyed about that, according to Stuver, than you would be if the guy on the management floor above you was getting a bigger wage. So it's relative to you. If you take gender inequality, women may concern themselves with the pay gap between other women rather than the gender pay gap, and that may um, maintain the status quo. And I thought that was a very interesting uh, example to use. Now, relative deprivation theory may lead to anger, and this may uh, mean that people will mobilize and protest or make themselves heard. However, it's according to Van Zommeren, it needs to be tied in with the two other aspects of this model, which are resource mobilization theory and social identity theory. Now, resource mobilization theory from McCarthy and Zald, 1977, it, it theorizes that people will make reasoned calculations as to whether to protest based on the feelings of the group efficacy. So is the group powerful and strong enough to make change? Now, people will they'll consider whether they protest whether the protest itself will make any real difference. Will the group with which they identify be effective in its aims? The theory is very useful for social groups such as Remain to understand how to get people actively involved in their cause. Now, if identity with the group is weak, people may be motivated by resource mobilization theory, but they may weigh up the cost-benefit ratio. So they may say, do you know what? I'm not going to walk around in the rain in London on a Saturday afternoon because I don't really feel, first of all, that this group has got the resources to make any difference. So this is an important part of the model. The next is social identity theory. Now, social identity theory is a very, very important and salient um, theory within social psychology. It was Tajwell and Turner in 1979. A lot happened in 1979 for anybody who studies psychology. It was a real bumper year for models. But it bridges the gap, really, between the two theories. And it predicts why people sometimes make rational and sometimes emotional choices with regards to protest. Now, with social identity theory, we have individual identities and uh, various self-concepts. But much of our identity and behavior is determined by self-categorization. So, for example, if I'm a football fan, I'm going to behave a hell of a lot differently with my fellow fans at a match than I might do dropping my child off to nursery. I mean, if I'm uh, a member of an anti-Brexit group, I might behave differently on a protest than I do as a member of the church committee. So social identity is how people define themselves as being part of a group, according to Taj and Turner. Now, people will identify with the group and they'll begin to take on the norms and values of the group. Now, I remember this when I was a teenager. I was, a, I think I was into a lot of different kind of music and in the 80s and the 90s, music was very much about identity. People became cure heads or mods or punks or goths or whatever they were. And I think for a while I was every one of those. But I remember I remember being part of that group, influencing the way I would behave outside of that group. So I think this is a really interesting point. Now, social identity theory suggests there are three socio-structural socio conditions for action. The group's social position must feel unstable and illegitimate, and a more desirable social position must seem impermeable. So Remainers, for example, may feel they need to make authorities listen to their concern because they feel the whole Brexit situation is out of their control. So Van Zommeren, Postmes and Spears did this meta-analysis, and they brought all these three factors together to form the SIMCA, the Social Identity Model of Collective Action. And conclusions were formed that all three theories predicted collective action, with social identity theory being the sort of bridge between the two. So according to Van Zommeren et al., if you didn't have social identity theory, the whole thing is not, is not going to work. You're going to have to have all three elements, but particularly social identity theory, because it's identity with the group that really drives activism. So... Klanderman and Amiga kind of built uh, built on these uh, theories uh, after um, social identity theory. They developed a four-stage model to understand the steps as to why people become activists, but also why they be be uh, stay as activists. So, first of all, the movement will obviously reach out to potential activists and they'll target sympathizers or 
you know, semi-involved individuals. Um, individuals then they're facilitated by the movement. If that, for example, in social media, let's say you like a page for Best for Britain. Then you might get an email from them, you know, or you might get some sort of a message on Facebook, you know, help us out, donate, whatever. So after this contact, the individuals may be motivated to, to be involved. But really, um, then it's possible that the individuals will find ways to man to not get involved. For example, family commitments, you know, work, etc. So this model um, really looked at why people stop being activists. They might be passionate in the first place, but then they might begin really to to stop uh, beyond sending a few emails. So really, uh, Van Zommer and Postmates and Spears suggested that there's two reasons why this can happen. The group efficacy, if the people believe in the es efficacy of the group, which I mentioned earlier, they'll more likely identify with the group and, and engage in collective action. And this may then lead to politicized identities because by identifying with the group's sense of injustice, for example, the Remainers may feel nobody's listening to us, Theresa May doesn't mention us, all she talks about is leavers, we're leaving with no deal, it's going to be a disaster. I won't get into this, by the way, because I'm just going to get, I'm just going to get annoyed, actually, so let, let's not do that. So, um, that people will then take on a politicised identity. Okay. Now, so the more people identify with the group, the more they'll be less motivated by efficacy and more motivated by the injustice. So the identity with the group is very, very crucial. The more people identify, the more personal it feels. We see this a lot with them, um, with politics nowadays, with this kind of vast gulf between the left and the right. And it, it becomes less about the person, the person's argument. Let's say you're listening to the argument of someone on the Conservative Party. It becomes less about their argument and more about the person because it's all about identity. Who's making the argument? So this is very, uh, even though this is 2008, this is a really good precursor to what's happened over the last couple of years. So group members will begin to develop an attitude towards the group, seeing it as doing no wrong. You see this a lot with, now with respect to Corbyn fans. I, I meet a lot of Corbyn fans who can't take a lot of criticism, and um, no matter what I say and no matter what he does. And I'm not going to dig, but it's just, a, it's just a, an, ob an observation. Now... So when people become politicized, they begin to share their identity with other group members and knowing that they, they share their views and are just like them. So then they are they are identifying with people who are like them, who want the same things, who are willing to get out on the streets and protest. Now, political action itself can actually change the psychology of individuals, um, which is, according to Taylor, uh, in the 21st century, people are changed by the societal, societal dynamics around them and will be susceptible to the changing world around them. So, for example, this can really have an effect on people's psychology. It can change the way they live, the way they think. Now, um, what else did I want to say about this social identity model of collective action? So, as, as these personal identities become social, Participating in these groups, getting out, protesting, walking the streets of London or Birmingham or Manchester, it may form a, a community of very empowered individuals and they can be determined to challenge the injustices they face and they can very much have a great effect. If they have a real belief in what they're doing, there's a strong sense of identity, then change you know, can, can happen. We see it all the time. Um, but the Simca model, it only offers an explanation of how people become involved, but it doesn't seem to offer an explanation of why people either leave or stop being activists or continue being activists. And perhaps, I'm only guessing now, I'm jamming here, maybe there could be more research on the personality type, the type of people who, who you know, you know the type of people I'm talking about. And you're thinking, gosh, I don't mind going on a march if it passes by my house, you know, and there's coffee and biscuits and stuff but I'm not really a march kind of person. I don't think I've been on many marches, maybe two or three. I, I'm not really an activist, and I, I kind of admire people who are activists, and I look at the telly, or I look at the marches, and I see people on Facebook or placards, and I think, I really wish I was out there making a difference. That's a really fantastic thing to do. And that made me think, is there a certain personality type who when, starts activism and then keeps going with it? Whereas I think I'd probably do it for a couple of Saturdays and then find something else to do. So, and also the very interesting thing I found when I read this information was that there's very considerable evidence that 
Active participation uh, provides strong psychological health benefits. Um, but there is more research needed in this area, apparently. So that's another one that could be interesting for someone who wants to do a master's or a PhD. So that's the social identity model of collective action. Um, a model, again, that I found very interesting on the module DD317, Social uh, Psychology with the Open University. I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about more of the uh, stuff we're doing in DE300 DE with the Open University. I've recently been doing a lot of work on memory and uh, the different part of our brains that affect memory. And uh, we, we did something last week about face blindness, which I think is called prognopasia. I could be wrong. Uh, which I found fascinating. So I'll read a little bit more of that, and perhaps on my next uh, video I shall talk about that. But thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Please hit like. Please tell your friends. And if you are a professional psychologist or someone with a master's or a PhD, I'm sure you're going to tear my videos to shreds, but that's okay. I'm still an undergraduate. Please leave comments which are positive and helpful, and I'll be delighted to respond. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon.